Hi, Jonna, and thank you for joining me in the conversation today. Um, would you like to start by just introducing yourself and how you came to being involved with Chisholm Hill Dance Space? I became involved with Chisholm Hill Dance Space after being involved with the X6 Collective south of the river. And then we moved north and we laid the floor, which um, I noted in the diaries goes over several weekends in 1981-82. That's according to the weekends I spent there, um, down to the putting the varnish on, you know. So I made little notes aside in between things, you know, my traveling and everything else, that was what I was coming back to do. And that was so important because once you got the floor laid, then everything else could happen. We got a few lights, you know, things started to come into the space. And it was a big thing to have this beautiful floor and the beautiful walls. And that is really what Chisholm Hill is based on, is having a space, it was always called space. And there were all the other artists there. So I have an arts background and I felt very at home there. And the East End was also very welcoming. Um, it was a different time. There was racism, but it was much more accepting that you'd have, you know, Bengali communities, you'd have um, African communities from various nations there. Um, so it was just really nice. It was a good feeling being there. It was very alive. I felt very, it was contemporary. Um, and then with the New Dance magazine, with Phil and the others, we'd be cutting and pasting on the days when the center wasn't being used for other things. And very slowly it got to be known. And I, I think it was its role in linking so many of the other, um, we had so many dance centers at that time. There was Riverside, there were, you know, the drill hall, which I became involved with with various events. And I was teaching, I was teaching modern dance. Um, so um, teaching and performing a little bit, some choreography of my own and mostly other people's. Great. Um, and that kind of leads me on to asking, what was your role um, at Chisholm Hill, um, both as part of the collective and that sort of membership um, of the organisation, but also um, what did you do in terms of um, the activities that you were part of whilst you were at Chisholm Hill? Yeah, I think I was, because I was on the initial collective, which literally meant sitting around on chairs, or on the floor, whether you feel comfortable. The space was very barren at that time. We didn't have any of those little offices and no washrooms. You had to go a long way to find a washroom. It's a huge building and everything was very rustic in those days, very drafty windows and so on. So, I mean, we, we were there, but we were very bundled up and, you know, making the most of the space, mostly for dancing. So I, I used to enjoy rolling around on the floor. <laughs> So it was definitely a social thing for me, um, making friends with the people that were involved. I don't think I was a great board attendee, but I think I did go to a fair number of those meetings. Um, in terms of sitting around, it was New Dance more that I would be involved with, and I did a lot of distribution. I came across one entry which showed a long list of places that I'd cycled to, and I'd put little notes like, cycled five hours. So I literally went around Greater London it was fun though, it was just discovering London, discovering Greater London, although I'd already lived there for some time. And um, it was a stable place for me. It was a link to all these people. And also we had lots of visiting performers. Katie Duck towards the end was somebody I was very, very inspired by with her improvisation. So I'd always been interested in improvisation. Yeah, so you were, um... you were teaching and you were performing and also, um you had a role in the New Dance magazine, the sort of putting that, putting that together, writing, and then distributing it as well. Um, yeah. There were a number of performances. I and mean, one of the perks, as I mentioned in the email, was um, being able to go and see whoever was performing, if you wanted to, and sometimes you didn't want to, but you know, that was great because you know, you'd meet people that you knew. And it was very alive. The scene was very, very vibrant at that time. There were just so many people performing different versions of ballet, like Michael Clark was doing outrageous stuff, you know, challenging the, the bourgeoisie. It was, it was just great, you know, every, I felt it was, um, it was good to be alive. It was great, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and before we started this conversation, you talked a little bit about um, Chisholm House community, which was obviously really important, you know, in establishing, 
when Chisholm Hill was established, building those relationships with the community and kind of identifying what Chisholm Hill's contribution might be to the community. Um, mm. And when I look at the archive, you know, there's such a clear um, relationship between performances and the workshops and the public engagement side of things. So there might be a visiting artist um, who will also do a series of workshops. Um, so I can imagine, you know, you were saying then that you could kind of just see so much different work, you know, you could drop into a variety of performances if you wanted to. Um, but I can see how that relationship between teaching and performance um, would, would kind of encourage um, a variety of audiences as well to come and see the actual performance if they had taken part in a workshop. Um, and also I noticed as well that, um, you know, youth dance company or, um, local dance groups might also perform as part of the evening um, performances so then you get this kind of real um, sort of integration of all different types of dances um, and also dance yes. backgrounds as well. Yes very much so. Um, from the performances along the canal of which there were many and I'm sure I took it part in, in a few Mary Prestige did a lot of that kind of stuff and I've also done um, performances just, just out in space. Um, even when I was at art school that was one of the things I focused on. Just just finding a space near Chisholm Hill or related to Chisholm Hill or even in Chisholm Hill um, that became a performance venue and then that would also draw members of the public perhaps who hadn't even heard of us before and um, we were limited because we only had that fire escape and stairs. We didn't have, you know, an elevator. I don't think even to this day, I'm not sure. We, we might have a service elevator, but yeah, but, so that's limit, but no other limits were there. Like we really did encourage, we had um, Indian dancing, we had dancing from whichever local communities were interested in coming and the children too. And I was looking at the new dance issue of uh, the Women's Day issue from 1980, summer 1980. And there's a whole feature in there with Evelyn Clade talking about dancing pregnant yeah. and um, she became very well known but she was very much part of that early scene she and Jackie and, and um, Anna of course they all knew each other really really well and they'd had more professional dance backgrounds but then there were people like myself who came in more from the kind of alternative contact side and I, I certainly never made a professional living as a dancer but I did make a living as a dance teacher and then I did go on to um, teach um, Alexander Technique, which is what I'm now involved with and have been until the pandemic arrived. Um, but the, the pictures of the performances um, with Emmelyn were hilarious because you kind of just see, and I remember being there, I think it was in Dartington actually, we had a strong link with Dartington College of Arts in Devon. And um, so Emmelyn and, and Steve Paxton and you know all the, all the greats, um, she, she'd be, she, one of part, part of the performance, she was lying on her back with the stomach and, and then a little boat, a little paper boat or something that was perched as she breathed. It was perched on the on the crest of this little hill that, you know, her son then became. Uh, it was it was quite fun. So I mean, really, just playing playing with the idea of dance, and no matter how you know classically trained one was, you could just take it and explore it and go wild with it. And every absolutely any well, you know, within reason, you didn't want to be harming somebody else. But there was there was this broadness of concept. You also had uh, co-counseling going on at that time, which created some interesting parameters, like everybody got into discussing the, you know, the emotional and the psychoanalytical side of it at the drop of a hat. So that led to some intense conversations. I remember having a few of those. So uh, it was it was very exciting though, and, and very interesting time. Yeah, I love the image of, um... Emmeline's performance with the bump and, and the and the boat kind of rocking um yeah it's rock really cool. boat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I just thought that now I never thought that at the time but she was rocking the boat in more ways than one yeah it's such a it's such a beautiful image but I guess um you know that work the work around pregnancy and motherhood and also um you know, the other things that we're talking about were really influenced by um, or underpinned by second wave feminism and, you know, the, all of those um, discourses that were happening at the time. Um, and I noticed in the archive that um, during the early years, and I don't know um, for how long it went on for, but there was always a crash 
um, for mothers to bring their children along to workshops um, and, and there'll be someone to look after them. So even, even things like that would have been um, quite radical, I would have thought, um, at the time. Yeah. Claire was very involved with that. She had her own child too later after Emily. Claire, might have been Claire Hayes. I have yeah. lost company with her now. Yeah. yeah. We danced together a little bit here and there. Um, we, th there were so many loose alliances because there, we're all we all sort of going along on a parallel path it seemed and we have our own interests but then we get together and the collective was a great thing for that because you could have those sort of casual conversations while you got on with the business but then you'd also have tea or you know it's England so you've got to have tea right yeah yeah and I guess that's where the sort of um the personal and like you were saying it was also your your social circle and your friends were there kind of yeah. collides with um, the development of your own practice and other things that you might be, have going on. Um, yes, yeah, community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, and other things I noticed as well were women's only classes, um, yes. which of course you do get now, but um, at that time, I suppose, um, very, uh, very few. And women only performances too, you know, where w women only audiences. That, that piece that Gabby did, Gabby Agus, yes. She, um, she called it 13 women, I think, and she did take it to R Riverside in the end, which I think was, for me anyway, that was uh, a little bit more mainstream. Uh, R Riverside had some quite well-known names coming in, um, people from the States, you know, and uh, people who were accepted in the mainstream media. So to have that piece there was significant. And she did it at the ICA and, and in other places as well. And Sue McLennan, who I mentioned in the email, she, she, they, those two worked together quite a bit. Um, yeah, so it was things like the performances on the street during International Women's Day with Anna Furs, you know, the one I mentioned with the May Day poll, yeah. and, and, and that was hilarious, you know, having us all dressed up with these old fashioned, well, it depends what, who, who you represented, but she did look at historical women who had been involved with the suffragette movement and so on, and I was Mary Wilson Craft. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was an interesting time to develop awareness of what it meant to be female yeah. in all that that could be and yeah. women only was one thing there were separatists there were men's groups um you know so people really exploring what it meant yeah um and my other question was you mentioned um there were other spaces and in London, there was Jewel Hall and um, Riverside. So Chisholm Hill was kind of part of um, an ecosystem, I suppose, um, of independent dance in some way. And I know you, you just said that Riverside was was more sort of uh, mainstream. But what was it about Chisholm Hill um, that appealed to you, or what drew you into Chisholm Hill? Um. Well, even though, you know, I'd be cycling, I lived in West London, so I lived closer to Riverside, but they, they didn't have a collective and space wasn't free. Um, as a member of the collective, I think the space was free to me at the time. I can't remember when we started charging. We did start charging early on, but it was a few pounds. It wasn't anything exorbitant. And even now, you can get scholarships and grants and they're very, very supportive. I know that the, the, the a second space, there's a smaller space as well as the main space now. So they, the space was a huge draw, having a space to rehearse in, having space to dance with other people or rehearse their pieces as well as your own um, or to teach. Um, if you were earning money, then you paid a little bit. It was very inspiring too. It, it was a very, um, even if it wasn't particularly warm physically, it was a warm environment to be in and the light was very good. So if you're affected by the environment as I am, then that was all very important stuff. And this chance that you'd meet someone coming in and out, you know, and there were dancers and, and other artists and um, that was important too, right from the beginning. We, we often used to have uh, art displays and we'd have music and film nights, not as much as the dance. The dance was always the key feature there. Um, the drill hall, as I mentioned, and then I'm trying to think of all the other ones. There was Hackney, there was Jackson Hall. Um, yeah. They were dotted around the city. I mean, London is so massive. It's got its own little milieu all array around. Um, so I was looking at some of the performance spaces, and I had started teaching um, movement to to actors as well at Questels in Ealing, which is way the other side. If you get on the line, you go right to the other end. 
So it, it was really um, London. I felt I was very involved in most of London, like all different parts of London. I was in the teaching of self-defense. I would literally teach. I think the maximum was about four classes a day, but it would involve cycling and all that traffic. And it's not like it is now, but it wasn't good then. Mm. So you'd go, you teach for an hour and a half, and then you'd get on the bike and you'd go and you'd just keep going through the day. And there's a group I was involved with called Jekka. Jekka was named for the five women that were involved. So that was an improvisation group. And we performed down in uh, Oval in the Oval House. Yeah. And that was also a center, it, it upgraded quite a bit, but the beginning was pretty rustic. And um, it was basically a hall and, and they had theater and they had dance and they had film and all sorts. I see they do film even now, they still have events and things happening down there on both. And then those of us that were working in London, we usually had other places in England that we would work as well. And those successful or, or ones that wanted to would perform or teach abroad as well. I didn't do as much of that. Yeah, I guess I guess that um, that is tied to being an independent dancer or independent practitioner that you are um, working in all these different places. And um, yeah, so it, it, when you were talking then, I was thinking about, you know, how Chisholm Hell wasn't just um, this isolated thing where things happened inside. It was also very open, you know, its members, it's the people that would come to it were also teaching or performing elsewhere and around the world. And obviously people would be invited in um, from all over the world. When they were in, in town, they might be invited to performance or workshop. So there seems like, you know, it really was part of a, a bigger network um, and also dialogue of things that were going on. And obviously the, um, American dancers, Steve Paxson and Lisa Nelson, and, and the techniques that came from America were really influential. Very. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I like the word dialogue because I think that was, it was, it was really, um, it was a network. Um, and so it facilitated, like someone like Kirsty, because she, she was an independent dancer, but she did have various people that she performed with and got known for those collaborations as well as her independent work so um that was um very important to have the inspiration of these people coming in and maybe they did a workshop or um, a series of classes um trisha brown came uh, to riverside for instance i was very very inspired by her i thought she was just great i still love her work that's that's fluidity the, the woman uh, who was teaching, Rosemary Butcher. Yeah. Yes, so I was involved, I used to go to her classes quite a bit because she did a lot of contact and it started to overlap with the Alexander work that I was getting more and more interested in. So um, she was also working with Sue and with Kirsty for sure and um, Gabby, I'm sure. So you'd meet some of the dancers there and there was another independent dancer, Francoise, and I worked with her a little bit and she sometimes teamed up with Jekka so um, Jekka didn't do a lot of performances because you could travel. This was before the uh, European Union, but people traveled um, across, you know, particularly as performers and teachers. Um, but I don't know how I first came across Chisholm Hell other than the X6, and I would have gone to X6 for workshops. Um, yeah, interesting what you what you're saying about Chisholm Hell um, and the relationships. And I was thinking about the relationships between other organisations, but then the relationships between other people. And um, it facilitated relationships, or it seems to have facilitated relationships on various levels with people, with places, with different disciplines. You were saying the the sort of coming together of what Rosemary Butcher was doing with the um, the Alexander technique that you were interested in, and other things as well kind of bringing lots of things together and exploring those relationships. Yes, it certainly wasn't an ins insular place where you maybe had a jazz class and you showed up for that and you went away, you didn't speak to anybody and that was it. You just went, you know, whatever else you did with your life, it just was a separate, it was never that for me. It always spilt over into, into wonderful um, connections. Judy Chicago, we haven't talked about her. Mm. She had a show, she came to town, so she was part of that boom of the women's liberation movement. So that, that show um, was huge. Um, she came, she, she lectured, I can't remember much about the lecture, but I do remember the show. Um, 
and something came up there. Um, I wanted to mention the man who was very um, instrumental, John Chapman. He was with something that doesn't exist anymore, the Greater London Arts, and he helped me a lot, or he actually employed me. I don't think I got paid necessarily, but I was asked if I'd do more and I could see how it was eating my time. So I didn't do any more. I think there was maybe a, a second year. So this was 1982, 83, a bit of my own stuff going on, but um, John Chapman, spelt as it sounds, he was very much involved with uh, women in entertainment and women entertainment was quite a big thing, London wide, women live. And uh, we did various things. Like I remember the drill hall did this huge, um, it was very exciting getting hold of people and asking that they, you know, donate a performance fundraising for um, the, the, the venues and um, for the performers themselves and for props and lights and travel and everything that needed to be happening. So that was the only time I think I took that kind of responsibility on it was it was exciting, but it was also another it was an administrative direction for me, which I didn't really think I wanted to take on at that time. The name of the theatre group that I was involved with was Questos Theatre in Mattock Lane in Ealing. So that was also beginning to solidify and come about in the first years, there were, I think, two or three years. And that was really, really nice to see the contact work. And the Alexander, which I was doing more of, I wasn't teaching it at that time, but um, the dance and a little bit of martial arts that I'd done, I saw how that helped the um, people who maybe had no, they weren't, you know, how some people just aren't in their bodies, they aren't connected. So it, they have to be connected if they're going to perform and they're going to see them perform and seeing the results, seeing the fruits of their, you know, their efforts. And sometimes they had specific things like, can you teach, teach me how to waltz? You know, so I had to find out how to waltz. <laughs> All this stuff, you know? So it was it was great to do the research and then to see the product. So it it connected, um, like you say, it, it didn't stop there. It went out into the community, went out into the teaching, and then further spread into in many many ways. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll finish finish up with this last question um, and ask you. If you had to describe what Chisholm Hell was at that time, how would you describe it? Um, beehive. Yeah, the, the essence of Chisholm Hell was this collaboration, like it was a collective. And I see how that's so important even now. I, you know, I'm, I felt that the sharing, there were people who had more experience with performance, more experience with administration or, you know, navigating the press or you know, aspects of that existence. But we, we seemed, my impression was that we worked together. You know, people like to dismiss collectives as being non-professional. And I, I think they're probably the epitome of being professional because they, you know, there's the new thinking about listening and leading by listening. And it's not that new really, is it? But in a true collective, I feel that um, you have that gift of sharing as we are doing now, that we, we're sharing ideas, we're sharing our interests, we're interested in the history. It, 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 yeah, it was, a, it was a beehive because it had this visiting, the, the, the visiting component, but it had a lot of cooking in the warmth of the hive. I, I think the whole concept of the collective is crucial to the art surviving. It won't survive any other way. Yeah, the press did come in. You know, press were there. I remember they even gave me a moderately good review for one of my solos, which I was very appreciative of. I didn't do a lot of performances. So I, I quite rapidly got diverted into teaching. Um, I, I think I was a bit shy of the performing too. Um, but uh, mm. I love that. I go mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to say, I really like that metaphor um, of the beehive because. Um, you know, like you say, the collective is intrinsic to that working and functioning, but also it's so linked to the space, the beehive itself, you know, and the actual structure. And you've, you've talked a lot about the space and, you know, the importance of just having space, but also the floor. And, you know, you can't do anything in the space until you've fitted the floor. So, um, you know, those two things come together quite nicely in that metaphor, which I think um, fits well with Chisholm How. It does, because each, you know, new bit of uh, acquisition, and it's not like we had money to throw around, but we keep applying for grants and you know, eventually we'd be successful. And 
So the work of getting the grant, which was something I was never particularly good at, mostly it, it was key people could do that, but then we'd support them. You know, maybe we'd we'd bring something to eat for the meeting, or maybe we'd be able to bring extra people along, or um, provide you know, sort of keep it going. There, there's, there has to be a sort of an energy there that keeps it going, and part of that energy is that friendship and respect um, to people like Phil and and Mary uh, were very key to me. Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much for talking to me and sharing with me. It's been such a pleasure to hear you talking about it. So thank you very much.